okay uh time to get started for the sixth and hopefully the last episode of our series this uh session would uh, discuss the gst implications of lease transactions any tax on a transaction may disrupt the level playing field between the transaction and alternative modes of doing the transaction uh for instance the closest alternative in case of lease transactions is a loan now if there is a tax which is applicable on lease transactions and the tax is not applicable in case of loan transactions it does disrupt the level playing field because eventually what matters is the cost to the customer and if the cost to the customer comes loaded or laden with any incremental tax the comparability or the the possibility of transitioning from one instrument to another one product to another becomes uh, impacted disrupted so the first question to discuss is that is whether and to what extent does a lease transaction disrupt the level playing field between leases and loans if you talk about financial leases which is what like we mentioning earlier majorly in the rest of the world lease transactions are uh, financial leases so if it's a financial lease right its closest comparable is to a loan transaction a financial lease compares with a loan so let's first write some basics here lease versus loan why do we make lease versus loan comparison assuming that the lease is comparable to a it's like a financial transaction if the lease is not a financial transaction then we are making comparison lease versus purchase i can go for a lease i can buy for example when you think of buying a house you might as well think of renting a house a rent a house or buy a house so here the comparison is between leasing as an alternative mode of acquiring the asset itself whereas if you decided to acquire the asset you talking about methods of funding Uh, loan becomes one of the modes of funding lease becomes another mode so if it's a financial transaction is lease versus loan comparison and therefore the right comparison we make is taking an asset on lease versus taking a loan to buy the asset what are the gst implications now as far as loan the concern the first and easiest comparison to make is that in case of a loan transaction the borrower buys the asset when he buys the asset he pays gst if the gst is applicable on the asset for example i'm buying a car i pay gst on the car the vendor the car vendor would charge me gst on the car i would have taken a loan from say a bank or a financial institution i'll be paying interest and the principal on the loan so first quick fact there is no gst on the interest in case of a loan transaction loans are not completely exempt but the interest in case of loans is exempt and major part of the loan repayment other than principal is actually the interest because additionally over and above the principal amount what am i paying i'm paying interest there's no gst on the interest component now if i look at the alternative and go to a lease transaction assuming that the asset in question was let's say costing 1000 rupees uh, cost of the asset is say 1000 and the principal component therefore be will be 1000 principal is therefore 1000 right and the interest let's say adds to interest over time let's say adds to say Uh, say rupees four hundred, let's say four hundred. So you're paying a total of, in case of a loan, you're paying total EMIs or total uh, installments equal to one thousand four hundred. If it's a lease transaction, that one thousand four hundred will become total of lease rentals. You're paying lease rentals equal to one thousand four hundred. Assuming it's a full pay transaction, which is what most financial transactions would be. In case of a loan, <coughs> there'll be no question of. tax or gst on the 400 rupees interest component there would have been a gst on the principal of the purchase value because the borrower would have purchased the goods if you if the same goods are taken on lease from a lessor now the moment you talk about a lease transaction please understand there is now talking about a triangular transaction lessor would go and buy the asset at which stage lessor would pay gst on the purchase lessor has to buy the same vehicle from a vendor when the lessor buys the goods from the vendor he would pay gst at whatever applicable rate whatever be the applicable rate. for example in case of cars it would mostly be 43% the lessor would have paid whatever applicable rate on the car right then the lessor would charge 
GST on the lease rentals. Now, there's some important point. Lease rentals become chargeable to GST. There's no distinction between principal and interest as in case of loan transaction. Therefore, the interest component, which has now become a part of lease rentals, becomes chargeable to GST. Therefore, GST would be charged on the entire rupees 1,400. I'm sure you do understand that the lessor would have a veiled GST on the rupees 1,000. They'll, therefore, he will pass on the GST on the 1,000 because he is paid GST on that. Therefore, who would, he would be getting the benefit of what you call input tax credit. Therefore, the GST on the principal value of 1,000, he would surely be passing that over to the lessee in some form. But he would not be passing anything more than the GST on 1,000. And therefore, he would be, he would be, I mean, recovering from the lessee GST on the additionality, that is the 400 rupee component, the finance charge component. He would be recovering that from the lessee. So in other words, there becomes a kind of additionality here. So the moment we talk about lease versus loan comparison, we're talking about something that disrupts the, the level playing field because in case of loans, there is no GST on the interest. In case of a lease, lease, there is a GST on the rental, which comprises of the financing component as well. Here, one could actually argue that though the lessee is paying GST on 1,400, but had he gone for purchase of the car himself, he would have paid GST on the purchase value outright. He would have paid the GST on the purchase value on the first day. So the day he buys the car, he would have paid GST. Now, he, in case of a lease, his obligation to pay GST on the rental is over a period of time. So it's the GST on the purchase price itself has now been deferred because instead of paying it outright, he's paying it by way of lease rentals. And he's paying it over a period of time. So if you were to present value the GST on the lease rentals, once again, if I'm present valuing the GST on the lease rentals, assuming the present value comes to 1000, in present value terms, the lessee is still paying GST on the 1000 rupees only. Because instead of paying it outright or upfront, he's paying it in graded installments over time. The present value of which, assuming the, the present valuation is done at the same rate as the interest rate inherent in the lease, if a present value the GST out GST liability of the lessee, the present value would still work out to GST on rupees 1000. Um, and, and therefore, there is no real additionality. Depends on the perception. Some people say, well, there is an additionality because you're charging GST on finance component as well. But if you present value the GST component, one would probably argue that there is no additionality. here. That's one way of comparing lease versus loan transaction. But to my mind, the present valuation principle is still, to my mind, agreeable, acceptable. But what is even more important is something like this is very important part that when you talk about a leasing entity, which is buying assets and giving them on lease. So think of a leasing entity it buys a car and gives it on lease. It buys a car, how much costing how much rupees in our example, rupees 1000. The leasing entity buys a car worth rupees 1000 paid GST upfront, whatever the GST rate be, right? Let's say it pays. Say, for, for instance, let's say it pays 28% or whatever, uh, 28, uh, yeah, it pays whatever, let's say X percent, let's say 28% GST. The GST is paid upfront by the leasing entity. That's an input tax credit available to the lessor, which the lessor may offset against the GST chargeable on the lease rentals. I'm sure our participants are familiar with the basic GST rule that the GST on the output may be offset by the GST on the inputs. Whatever GST liability is there on the output, output in case of lessor will be the lease rentals. The lease rentals become the output. Therefore, the GST is chargeable on the output over a period of time. So periodically, whatever the lease rentals are, assuming the first year lease rentals are, let's say, one third of 1,400, let's say roughly about whatever 400 something, 467. The GST is chargeable on 467, which is the lease rental for a year. So GST rate on 467, but from this, I'll be able to, able to offset the GST paid on the car itself, which is GST rate on 1000, which means I have more of input tax credit than the tax payable on output. Um, once again, since the input for the lessor is the cost of the asset and the output is only the rental, 
rental in any given year would just be a fraction of the cost of the asset and therefore the output tax is substantially lesser than the input tax this is for one asset next year probably you will say well partly the input tax credit would have been exhausted already so second year we might still have itc left by third year we'll probably have no itc left and we'll only have out output taxes but the second and third year i would have acquired more such assets as the lessor is continuously in the business of leasing every acquisition of a capital asset by the lessor leads to the same situation that i have more of input taxes than output taxes i have more of input tax credit than the output tax liability which means there is a running luggage there is a running what we call backlog of input tax credit which has been paid by the lessor but the offset of which is still not been availed because the output taxes are still lesser than the input taxes for any lessor who is in business it would take some years particularly if the leasing business is happening at a growing rate it would take several years before the lessor comes into a situation where the input taxes can be absorbed immediately against the output tax liability it would require a very high level of maturity but most of the leasing players in the country are still at a growing stage of business so most of them have this luggage of input tax credit that is a bigger problem instead of looking at the tax on the financing charges as something that disrupts the level playing field in my view the bigger issue for leasing business in india is the input taxes are always in excess of the output taxes and therefore the lessor is never able to avail the benefit of input tax immediately he pays that money outright he pays the gst immediately but he is not able to offset that immediately and therefore he suffers a financing cost on that he is he has passed on the benefit of gst on the input taxes without actually availing it i just mentioned some time back that he would pass on the gst on the input taxes he has passed on that benefit but he is not been able to avail it still and therefore the effective post gst internal rate of return for the lessor would be significantly lesser the extent of the difference between pre gst irr and the post gst irr of the lessor <clears throat> would depend on the gst rate and of course the tenure of the transaction the longer the tenure the more would be the impact right and therefore the post gst irr suffers because the lessor is not been able to avail the benefit of input taxes immediately that's a bigger issue in case of lease transaction so the quick point we wanted to mention is that uh, there is um, there's no level playing field between lease transactions and loan transactions in india and if you if people recall what i mentioned in the first episode that therefore there is no great region for people to enter into financial lease financial lease after all is almost a comparable financial transaction you would suffer additionality of gst without getting any significant benefit and therefore most of the leases in india happen to be operating leases where there is some other motive either off balance sheet or maybe higher residual value or or whatever else there might be other motives for a lessor to do operating leases in india financial leases because of additionality of gst does not seem to be an extremely tempting option in the country at this stage so this was a quick introductory note before we introduce the basics of uh, gst on lease transactions coming to the basics um uh, let's uh, first talk about a uh, first quick introduction to the rule that is a lease transaction sorry So I just missed that. Just give me a second to come back. Right. So triangularity of transaction: the lessor buys the asset from the vendor. The lessor pays GST at that stage. The lessor pays GST at this stage first. he buys and therefore at this stage he pays cost of acquisition plus gst then he does the lease they would pay gst on the rentals as and when the rentals accrue 
end of the term, there might be a sale by the lesser once again, at which stage the GST would come again, depending on the sale price. Now, does, does, does a lease transaction amount to a supply of service or supply of goods? GST is applicable on supply of goods and supply of goods. These are a little bit of technicalities of GST. There's a distinction between supply of goods and supply of services. That distinction in real practice is not of any great value because both are taxable anyway. But certain rules, for example, place of supply rules, etc., are dependent on whether you're talking about a set supply of services, supply of goods. So in case of lease transaction, a transfer of right to use goods is taken as a supply of service. A transfer of right to use goods, which is what we commonly call a lease, a lease is a transfer of right to use goods, is taken to be a supply of a service. Transfer of title in goods, for example, if it was a straight conditional sale or higher purchase, which automatically uh, results into title transfer, that would have been a case of supply of goods. So uh, nominal value, for example, one rupee option, which you pay, I mean, pay and the asset get transferred immediately. That would have been a supply of goods, but a lease generally would be a supply of service. Whether financial lease or operating lease would at all be distinguished for GST purposes, the answer is very clearly no. No, a financial lease versus operating lease will both be the same from GST point of view. Both are transfer of services. Whatever be the rentals, period after period, both would be chargeable to GST. <coughs> what is the GST rate applicable? The GST rate will be the rate as applicable to the goods. A lease is a supply of service, but the rate in case of a lease is the same as the rate applicable on the sale of the relevant goods. So whatever the relevant goods there are, the rate will be the rate applicable on the relevant goods. Sometimes in a lease transaction, there might be two different components. For example, think of a lease of a car. Lesser could probably say, I'm leasing out a car and I'm also providing, let's say, maintenance services. So I have a lease rental and I've got a maintenance service. So they, this is what, what the moment you're talking about a lease of a car and a maintenance service and you're not charging one single rental, you're charging two separate, I mean, there are two separate components. I'm separately charging for the lease rentals. I'm separately charging for the maintenance service. In that case, I'll charge two separate rates. The rate for the lease of the car and the rate, the rate for the lease of the car will be the rate applicable to cars. And the rate for the maintenance service will be the rate applicable to the maintenance service. So the rates will be the rates applicable on the relevant supplies. If there is one common rental which is consisting of two components, that becomes what is called a mixed supply. If you have a mixed supply, in that case, a mixed supply will be chargeable at the higher of the two applicable rates. For example, if I get one single rental, which is consisting of, say, the lessor is providing for the lease of the car and the lessor also provides insurance, which is bundled al along with the part of the lease itself. Let's say the lessor also maintains the asset, which is also bundled along with the lease. In that case, can't help it because there, there's, it's a case of mixed supply. The consideration is not separately identified. We're charging one common consideration. In that case, the higher of the applicable GST rates. For example, insurance might have been charged at an 18% rate, but because it's mixed up together, the rate will be borrowed from the rate applicable to the higher of the taxable components. In this case, it would be the rate applicable to sale of cars. So that's the tax, the tax rate applicable in case of um, lease transaction. Another question which comes in case of leases typically will be, shall we be charging IGST or shall we charge CGST versus SGST? I'm discussing these uh, technical questions first before we come to the options in case of uh, leasing entities. Uh, I'll, I'll, and that, that's a little more important point, so I'll maybe come to that very quickly now. So first, should we be charging <coughs> CGST and SGST or should we charge IGST? IGST, which is integrated GST, is applicable in case of interstate supply of goods or interstate supply of services. Interstate supplies are happening across two states, IGST is applicable. Supplies happening within the state, CGST and IGST are CGST and SGST are applicable. SGST in that case will be that of the relevant state. If Maharashtra, for example, it will be Maharashtra GST. 
IGST is applicable depending on uh, IGST is applicable if it's an interstate supply. So in case of a lease, what's the rule for fixing whether the supply is interstate or intrastate? For fixation of the nature of supply, what we need to see is the place of location of the supplier and the place of the supply. The place of supply in case of services is the place of residence of the taxpayer. The taxpayer in this case will be the lessee recipient. Recipient in this case will be lessee. So place of registered, I mean place of registration of the lessee will be the place of supply and place of registration of the supplier that is the lessor will be the place from where the lessor supplies the service. So let's assume the lessor is registered in state of Maharashtra, is giving a lease to a lessee in the state of Karnataka, the lessor should be charging IGST. If the lessor is business across the country, but the lessor is registered from out of Maharashtra for the leasing business, in our view, it's reasonably safe for the lessor to start charging IGST for all the supplies made across the country except Maharashtra. It's only for the lessees who are registered in Maharashtra that it should be charging CGST, SGST of Maharashtra. So that's broadly the distinction between IGST and the CGST. Now, we will, now before we get into the options available to a leasing entity for claiming offset, there's yet another quick point we need to discuss, which is in certain assets, there is no benefit of GST available to the user, to the lessee. So let me quickly first state here that generally speaking, if the supply is what you call B2B supply, a business supplies to a business, the seller is a business entity, the buyer is a business entity, there's no incremental GST burden because whatever is the GST charged by seller can be offset by the buyer when the buyer does his own sale. A sells to B, A will charge GST. B will therefore pay GST. But whatever GST B has paid, B will be able to claim it as a set off when B sells it over to C. So if it's a B2B transaction, A sells to B, B sells to C, and let's say C sells to the ultimate consumer, the moment sell, C sells to consumer, it becomes a B2C transaction, business to consumer transaction. At that stage, the consumer obviously is not GST registered. The, therefore, the consumer would not be able to pass on GST to an, anybody else. That's where the GST journey stops. Tax inefficiency of GST lies in the GST journey stopping. As long as the journey continues, the GST continues to get... Uh, relegated to the next level, there's no tax inefficient because whatever GST is paid at the first stage is passed over at the second stage. But the moment that passing, the passing of the buck, the passing of the, the, the relay of GST stops, which means the moment you come to a B2C transaction, that's the last point because the consumer cannot pass any further. That's where the burden gets frozen. So in normal case, let's say lessor is leasing to a lessee, lessor will charge GST on the lease rentals, but the lessee will be able to claim an offset. Whatever lease rentals, whatever GST charged by the lessor on the lease rentals, the lessee would be able to claim a set off. There are certain items where claim for input taxes is not allowed. Now the major item which is leasable among the list of so-called blocked input tax credit items, the major item is motor vehicles excepting those which are used in the business of transportation of goods or, goods or passengers. That is, unless somebody is taking a car for running it as a taxi, or unless somebody is taking a, let's say, lorry for uh, transportation of goods, the buyer or the, I mean, the acquirer of a car, which is used not for carrying passengers and not for carrying goods, will not be able to claim GST set off. If I buy a car, for example, even if I'm a business entity, even if I'm a company buying a car, the company will not be able to claim set off for the GST paid on purchase of a car because motor vehicles, consumer motor vehicles are ineligible for claiming GST. So if a lessor was to give a lease of vehicles to a company, yesterday, last episode, we we're talking about employee car leasing business in, in, in the country and the lessor gives the lease of cars to employer charging GST from the employer the employer will not be able to claim this set off at all because the employer has acquired the cars not for business of running transportation service. The employer cannot be saying that I'm running transport service 
transporting my employees employer is not in the business of transportation therefore the employer will not be able to claim set off of gst here therefore that becomes the last point for gst even though it's a b2b transaction there's no further i mean claim of gst set off at the employer level because we're talking about a motor vehicle we're talking about a passenger motor vehicle that's one exception to the normal rule that in b2b transactions usually gst is passed on now when it comes to claiming of set off of ltc by the lessor there is a major uh, point that comes because most of the lessors in fact the lessors in india could either be dedicated leasing entities which are into business of leasing only or some of them them are nbfcs which do other financial activities and which do leasing as well so the if you have a non banking finance company which is doing leasing as well in case of banks or nbfc so normal rule let's let's first state the normal rule and then we come to why there was a specific exception given in case of banks and non banking finance companies normal rule is that <clears throat> i would be able to claim itc against my output taxes with the exception remember once again i'll be claiming i'll be eligible to claim itc against my output taxes with the exception that if some of my outputs are exempt from tax some of my outputs are exempt from tax i will not be allowed to claim itc for providing those supplies supplies or goods or services which are exempt from gst if i am let's say in business of making supplies some of which are taxable some of which are exempt i was quite intuitive that i should not be able to claim itc for an output which is actually exempt from tax so once again stating the rule that if i am making taxable supplies as well as tax exempt supplies i can claim only itc for those acquisitions which were made for the taxable part of my output not for the tax exempt part of my output that's the simple rule stated in section 17 by 2 of the cgst act now comes the case of banks or financial institution i'm sure you can appreciate in case of banks banks what is the output what is the output for a bank partly number one interest number two any kind of service charges remittances service charges whatever i mean whatever other charges banks can locker charges whatever charges banks impose as far as interest is concerned that's an exempt supply because interest is not chargeable to gst rest of the services provided by banks most of them are chargeable so the bank is engaged in the business of providing taxable outputs as also tax exempt outputs look at an nbfc same way nbfc is also mainly give loans but they have other charges as well some of which are in fact most of non interest charges are chargeable to gst so nbfcs and banks are in the same uh, footing they have tax exempt supplies they have taxable supplies as well now shorna please also appreciate that tax exempt supplies will be far higher because mostly the revenues will comprise of interest lesser part of revenues will actually have taxable output however for the benefit of banks and banks and registered nbfcs an option is given it's an option is given in section 174 of the cgst act to say that a bank or nbfc may opt to instead of proportionally computing what inputs went for interest and what inputs went for the rest of the supplies they may choose a simple ad hoc rule which is called 5050 rule the 5050 rule is that you may just take 50% of input taxes and claim that as a set off against taxable outputs and please also appreciate appreciate that for most banks and nbfcs this option works to their advantage because if they were to compute the actual proportion the actual proportion of taxable supplies will be far less than lesser than 50 so what they can do the entire outputs which are chargeable to gst half of the input taxes are set off against the output of a bank or nbfc now we stated 172 and 17 174 is by the way an option the option is exchangeable on a financial year basis that is for a financial year i make this choice i can change the option i can change the choice next year if i want to if the nbfc is therefore doing leasing a question that comes if the nbfc is doing leasing will this 50 50 rule therefore 
be applicable to purchases made for the purpose of leasing business as well because the lessor buys a motor car and say i'm buying this car for the purpose of leasing the entire output is taxable but if i say half of the input taxes on the purchase of car will have to be lost because of the 50 50 rule then i'm into real serious problem leasing business will become extremely unviable if the 50 50 rule was applicable to a leasing business as well so here the understanding that we i think we need to actually uh, i mean put this understanding clear that 17 4 is an option number one it's not an obligation it's an option so either you may choose the option you may not choose the option but when it comes to leasing business admittedly whatever acquisitions are being made for leasing business are clearly identifiable when i'm buying assets for the purpose of lease identifiability is quite clear whichever assets i'm buying for the purpose of leasing business is very clearly identifiable so the question of applying section 17 by 4 does not apply there because i am able to apportion very clearly those inputs which are being acquired for leasing business and therefore the 50 50 rule has no applicability there i can rather choose what you call uh, 17 by 2 which means i can take the actual purchases made for leasing business and take them as a set off so there are therefore there are two option there is a third option which technically does exist but that's a complicated option called separate registration for gst purposes of the leasing business do understand that i may not have a separate pan for leasing business i'm common single entity doing leasing business but for gst purposes i can actually register the leasing business separate i can have a separate gst in for the leasing business that's a complication i wouldn't want to get into so the simple rule in case of uh nbfcs which are into leasing business is that 174 is just an option 172 makes it clear that whatever inputs are being acquired for the purpose of leasing business one can claim a set off for those inputs without being hit by the 50. so 50 50 rule will continue to apply for the rest of i mean rest of uh, non leasing uh, activities that is rest of the activities as far as inputs acquired for leasing business for which we will be able to anyway make a separate computation the entire inputs will still be available for set off so that's the uh, discussion on lease transaction this was relatively a shorter uh, uh, episode uh, but uh, let's understand if there are any questions from any of the part anyone who has any questions if you can do a hand raise first to allow me to understand if there are questions if not then this would be time to uh, there is a question there are couple of questions or oh, in fact there are three questions already so let's start with uh, anita bet so this is abhiru here so can you i mean under gs Maybe a little louder for the benefit of everyone sorry is this better now okay so my question is ki um, leasing is a tax uh, sub, i mean uh, supply of service right a uh, renting is also supply of service so how do and both of these carry two different sets of rates so renting is itself seen as a taxable supply and a specific rate is mentioned there and for lease we usually go back to the original i mean the rate applicable on the original asset so how do we distinguish between a rent and a lease because a lease could be of a shorter tenure also right it could be one year lease also there is no i mean during the service tax regime because uh, and i think it's a common knowledge once again that prior to introduction of gst we had two separate laws one dealing with the vat so on sale of goods another dealing with services which is service tax and there were several rulings on what is the whether rental amounts to a service or it amounts to sale of goods because the word used for sale of goods is transfer of right to use any goods transfer of right to use goods is a lease running goods to provide transportation transportation service that becomes a service service meaning what i am running the goods to provide a rental service that is rental service therefore would mean typically it would mean point to point i mean either at very short term supply with there is no transfer of right to use at all the goods are in exclusive possession of the lessor the goods are controlled by the lessor the lessor rents out once the rental is over the goods come back and surely the rental would be shorter tenure typical rental car rental companies for example we take a car rental for what a day 
uh, yeah. few words for example so number one the service might either be point to point for example let transport me from delhi to mumbai and leave me there and then the car goes back that's one rental service another rental service could be the the rental is typically under the control of the lessor there are of course self use rentals also these days self use rentals also fairly common drive yeah. yourself but the control is with the lessor there is no transfer of right to use to the lessee at all so distinguishing factors between a, le- a supply of goods and a supply of service a lease and a pure rental contract would depend on has the lessor at all provided any exclusivity provided control over the asset to the lessee if yes it becomes a case of transfer of right to use otherwise the lessor is running a rental business uh, rentals that would mean the rental business is being run by the lessor so number one of course it will reflect on the registration of the vehicle as well it's a rental car not a self use car yes. yellow plated i think as yes. opposed to yes. white plated that's yes. part one number two it would also mean the nature of contract between the lessor and lessee there's no exclusivity there's no control passed on to the lessee in which case of course you can claim benefit of a lower rate as against the rate applicable to motor vehicles this is an idea abiru but i don't think the idea found a lot of uh, acceptance because people would normally not be comfortable with the using a yellow yellow plated vehicle hmm imagine I'll... somebody going to a social occasion with a yellow plated car how does it look like not sure hmm okay mr ganesh pakala hi sir sorry i forgot to ask on uh, accounting time sir sir can you uh, explain about the provisioning thing for leasing in a nbfc sir Pro- is there any provisioning and it if the lease is a financial lease in that case provisioning is applicable as in case of any financial transaction if the lease happens to be financial lease provisioning norms are the same as applicable to financial transaction in the actual wording of the rbi's regulation there is a bit of complication there but i think the gist of that is that the interest will not be taken as income and there'll be an additional provision uh, to the extent of uh, 10% as applicable to any substandard asset if the lease is a financial lease if the lease is an operating lease there is no provisioning norms of rbi applicable rbi cannot be providing for the rental will be reversed the rental which is billed but not collected the rental which will become npa will be reversed for sure but there is no provision on the asset itself as provided by rbi there in our view impairment rules as applicable under accounting senate should come into picture that would mean the lessor should if the lease transaction has become non performing it becomes sticky that would mean i should now be looking at the value of the asset therefore the lessor should consider impairing the asset if the value of the asset is considerably lesser than the amount outstanding RBI does not have any provisioning norms for operating leases because that's not a financial transaction at all except the reversal of the rentals which have been booked as income but which have not been collected so uh, is there any difference between finance lease provision and the loan provision as per RBI as per RBI it's this i mean the wording is quite complicated because the RBI is going by very old language of its own regulations which was drawn at the time when there was a guidance note on lease accounting way back by the institute but the essence of that provision is still the same that a financial lease is at par with the loan when it comes to provisioning or income recognition requirements okay. thank you there's, there's no significant difference okay. uh, there's a question by prapti uh, sir i'm not able to understand the 50 50% gst requirement that you mentioned for an nbfc so like how is it not uh, beneficial to an nbfc to claim uh, gst on lease lease it will not be beneficial i'll explain that in generally speaking it's beneficial i hope that's easy to understand if the entity was not into leasing business it's beneficial i'm sure we can understand because we need to see the proportion of taxable versus tax tax exempt supplies taxable supply in case of an nbfc is what service charges x penalties penalties questionable though service charges or whatever the prepayment charges any the charges documentation charges those charges will be much smaller than the interest income on a entity wide basis interest will form a bulk of the income other incomes that is other than interest will still be small small proportion so if i did not choose 50 50 rule assuming interest is 80% of the revenues 
and the rest of the revenue is only 20 percent then on the input taxes i'll probably be doing 80 20 apportionment only 20 percent of the input taxes will be eligible for setup because most of my outputs are actually exempt so therefore 50 50 rule generally works to the benefit of an nbfc other than in leasing business the moment you talk about leasing business the entire lease rental is chargeable to gst assuming an nbfc does lease the entire lease rental is chargeable to gst but when i buy an asset for the purpose of lease half of the input taxes half, half of the taxes paid on purchase will be lost forever i'll never be able to claim it 50 50 rule would mean that remaining half will be lost for all time to come so i'll only be claimable if i paid 18 percent gst i'll be able to claim only nine percent whereas the entire rentals will be chargeable to 18 percent gst so that will not be beneficial for a, particularly looking at the aggregate volume of these it's a question of comparing i mean the overall volume but my understanding is that for most entities which are in leasing business the 50 50 rule will not work to the benefit of because the half of the input taxes will be denied for all time to come understood sir so further question on this like uh, how can an nbfc bifurcate amongst the services that for this services i will claim 50 percent uh, under regulation 174 and for leasing i will claim uh like i will claim 100 percent gst for leasing the major input is the purchase of the asset itself not sure what else employee salaries and anyway not chargeable to gst among the input taxes what else will the leasing entity have input taxes primarily is the purchase of the asset itself rest of the common overheads even if for a minute for a minute let's say i was to let's say completely ignore them even then i'll probably be better off so my question is like can you select different treatment for the services that you are offering like if any nbfc is charging uh, certain charges to a customer for so, it the charges other than interest everything else is chargeable to gst therefore when it comes to what i'm charging to the customer lease rental is chargeable to gst other costs are also chargeable to gst i'm now looking at my expense side on the expense side of an entity engaged in leasing business a the purchase of the goods that's a major bulk item because whatever items are given on lease i'll i'll first have to buy them so that's one major item the rest of the items are overheads expenses expenses number one include employee benefit employee cost there's no gst on that probably office rental there might be gst on that let's say insurance paid for office assets there might be gst on that some other services for example whatever else i buy the typical supplies that we buy for office purposes there might be a gst on that so the input taxes paid by a leasing entity even if you are not able to allocate it would probably be able to allocate let's say on a proportional basis it should not be difficult to allocate on a proportional basis but even if for a minute let's say we ignore everything even then being able to claim the full gst on the purchase of lease goods because that's the bulk of the acquisition that would still be beneficial instead of falling under the 50 50 rule and losing half of the gst permanently uh there's a hendrix vanita is that done or do you no sir so uh, in case of wet leases in ca uh, wherein we are providing uh, uh other services as well how do we uh and the services may have different gst rates so for the lease of the asset the rate of gst would be, might be different from the uh from that what is charged for the services how do we uh charge gst in that case is it different invoices or how is it done the first thing wet lease as a term is mostly used in case of aircraft and ships let's say i'm giving a lease of a car where i'm also providing maintenance i i wouldn't want to use the term wet lease because wet lease historically has been associated with ships and aircrafts i would still call it a value added i can probably call it value added terminology is not my issue here i can call it a value added lease so this is let's say value added lease i've given a value added lease where i'm providing the car on lease i'm also taking care of the maintenance i'm also probably providing let's say replacement supposing the vehicle goes uh, of uh, because of uh, let's say repairs i'll be probably provide a replacement vehicle for two days let's say i provide insurance is also bundled i provide insurance as well so i provide services other than simply providing the car now there are two scenarios i have one common rental for everything if i have one common rental 
then it becomes a case of a mixed supply because I'm not able to allocate the item. I mean, I'm not able to allocate the consideration for different items bundled in this in the service together. The items are bundled together. I have one common consideration, so it's not possible to allocate or bifurcate. Therefore, the rate of tax will be the rate of tax applicable on the higher of the components. Highest of the tax component here would be the car itself. Others are 18 percent car will be higher, probably 43. So I'll therefore be charging the car GST rate on all the components. Therefore, it's not never beneficial to bundle the items along with the car. I hope that's very clear. Other option for me is to separately charge for the maintenance, I charge separately. So my rental is split. I charge whatever, let's say 30,000 rupees for the car. I charge 2,000 rupees for the maintenance. I charge 3,000 rupees for the insurance component. I charge separately each component, in which case I will charge GST at the respective rates applicable for each of the supplies. The moment you talk about separate GST rates for each of the supplies, Please also understand that in the marketplace, there is a practice where people inflate those other components and deflate the carwala component. The carwala component is a higher rate, so they deflate that, inflate the other component. I'm not recommending any of those devices because these are two no-brainer devices. And very soon they are seen or caught by the GST officials. So without getting into those uh, uh, avoidance tricks, the rate is the rate applicable on the higher of the components. So I think that probably takes care of all the questions today. And this will be completion of our uh, six lecture series on basics of leasing. Thank you all for participating and wish you all the best. Bye-bye.